everybody. Welcome to the Good Evening Kitties podcast, a Tales from the Crypt review. My name is Melissa, your ghostess with the mostess, and today's episode is Season 7, Episode 8, Report from the Grave. So I'm back to drinking the tea, what I was doing in earlier episodes this season, because in Season 7, it's set in the UK. I was drinking and trying different types of tea in some of the earlier episodes, and I took a little bit of a break, and now I'm back to it. I'm drinking my favorite hot tea. I'm drinking chamomile or chamomile or chamomile. <laughs> I don't know, but it's my probably my go-to hot tea. I usually have it with sugar. If I have a cold or something, I might put some honey in it, but that's what I'm having. It's a nice, light, flowery, easy on the stomach hot tea. So let me just take a sip of that. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. That's what I'm drinking, a nice relaxing cup of chamomile tea. This tea kind of reminds me actually of a story I read when I was a kid, and I think it's about Peter Rabbit or Peter Cottontail, probably the same per uh, same bunny. So it was like, he was a kid, Peter Rabbit, and he had three little sisters, uh, Flopsy, Mopsy, and Cottontail. They were all like out playing, and their mom, the mama rabbit was like, hey, come inside because it's going to rain really hard. And the girls came in and then Peter was like, not me. And then he went and ran around in the rain. And then when he woke up the next morning after coming home, he woke up with the cold or he was like really sick. So he didn't get to enjoy the fun treats that the sisters got. They got to have um, blackberries, cream and bread, I think, as a treat, which I'm not sure if they'd like cream or bread. And he got to have medicine and chamomile tea. That was what he got to have because, you know, the lesson is to listen to your, your mother and not run around in the rain, I guess. So that's what this tea kind of reminds me of. That's Tea Corner. I needed this nice cup of relaxing tea. And you know why? Because this episode is a lot. It's a lot to get through. It's not great. Honestly, uh, season seven, episode eight, Report from the Grave is probably so far my least favorite episode of season seven. <sighs> I don't, still don't quite understand it. Let me explain a little bit. So this episode, it's, it feels like they tried to put too much into like 24 minutes. I think they had probably a lot of ideas and I think some of it probably had to get cut or edited in a way that makes it not flow really well. Like the transition between the scenes seems a bit abrupt. There's some scenes that probably shouldn't be in there. There's a scene that's too long. I'm going to do my best to explain it. If I get it wrong, I get it wrong, but... I've watched this episode a couple times. So the first time I watched it for the podcast, when it was over, I was like, wait, what? What happened? I didn't quite get it. So then I waited a little bit and I watched it again. And I kind of got it a little more, but it still just wasn't that, it's not great. And so, okay. And then I just had like different things with life and like I did some traveling and stuff. So like I hadn't gotten around to recording this episode. So I was kind of, it's been getting longer and longer the wait. So I've had to revisit this episode like three or four times to kind of get a feel and like understanding for some of it. And it's still, it's still not great. So again, let's get into it. I hope you're excited for this episode. Season 7, Episode 8, Report from the Grave. As always, John Kassir does the voice of the Crypt Keeper and Danny Elfman does the theme song. This episode aired June 14th, 1996. It was directed by William Malone, who also directed movies like the 1999 version of House on Haunted Hill and the Tales from the Crypt episode Only Skin Deep. Now that's a pretty fun episode. Only Skin Deep is fun. And now that I think about it, some of the effects in this episode do remind me of House on Haunted Hill from 1999. So it doesn't surprise me because this was that would have been like three years later. There's some shaky cam stuff on the bad guy that definitely reminds me of the bad guy in House on Haunted Hill. There's also another tie, I believe, to it. Uh, yeah, in the IMDb trivia that I'll get to later. The screenplay was also by William Malone. It stars James Frain from TV's True Blood and Gotham. Siobhan Flynn from TV's Jack of Hearts and video game voice work, Jonathan Firth from TV's Covington Cross and Middlemarch, Gordon Peters from voice work on TV's Mr. Men and Little Miss, and Roger Ashton Griffiths from movies like Brazil and TV's Game of Thrones. So I'm going to go ahead here and read the description on the back of the box for Report from the Grave. And you thought there was a lack of scientific creativity. A man invents a way to read memories of the dead. Kinda? I mean, that's kind of what it's about. I, I wouldn't describe it like that, but okay. Let's get into this episode here. So it opens up, of course, like they all do with the Crypt Keeper and his crypt. And he's a farmer in this one. There's uh, like some 
some corn stalks and he's in a cute little farmer's outfit with a bandana and a hat harvesting his own little field of screams and having a good time and so he's like he's like, it's it's mostly just from like shoulders up they don't show like the whole crib keeper in this intro and then he brings in the episode so season seven episode eight report from the grave opens up in a graveyard because it's report from the grave so it opens up in the graveyard. It's got a, like a, it's kind of a cool intro scene, probably like on a soundstage or something, maybe. But um, it's this graveyard and there's like these trees. And basically we're going from crypt to crypt. So we're going from the crypt keeper to this crypt because they're heading in through the graveyard with their stuff. Um, it's two people, Elliot played by James Frain and Ariane by uh, Siobhan Flynn. And they have their equipment. They have like a, just some like um, cases and other equipment and they're walking up into the crypt and talking about different things like the Heisenberg properties and things like that. He, Elliot, is basically showing that to Arion or Ariane. I'm going to say Arion. So they go into this crypt and the crypt's kind of cool. Like it's just this, um, it seems like a lot of things could get in here because it's not really sealed. It's got like a, a see-through type gate with like a grid, like a grid on it that's open um, like you could pass through it, but it's, I guess the, the door was locked and there's a lot of cobwebs and dust and dirt. And I think this scene was actually set up fairly well. This is one of the better things of the episode is just this backdrop and set for it. And maybe that's why they spent so much time in this because they spent a good amount of time in this scene. Uh, and it takes up a large chunk of the time in this episode, which I think they could have maybe used better with other stuff. So basically they're in here and Elliot and Arion or Ariane, ah, Arion, what, I'm just gonna call her Arion, I can't remember how it's pronounced. So Arion and Elliot are together, and Elliot is doing, like, this work on, like, a PhD or something about this research he's been doing on this guy named Vladimir Timrak, who was, like, a psycho serial killer, and, and his work is, like, all this stuff about reaching out to the dead or, or things like that, and he's worried that someone is selling out his research, trying to like pass it on before he can finish it. Because he's got these like little circuitry devices that he's using to get brainwaves or memories or something from the dead. So he thinks maybe Ariane did it. And she's like, what are you talking about? I would never do that to you. And so she does this thing where like she takes a marker, like a little red marker, and she draws this heart in the middle of his hand. And so she draws the heart and she's all like, You'll always have my heart in your hands. Take care of it. Elliot, I didn't steal your documents. Well, someone did. My work is being stolen. Documents from the experiments are missing from my files. Maybe you mislaid them. I didn't mislay them, Ariane. That work is my blood. I depend on that work to get grants. It's my future, and someone is stealing it from me. Elliot, look at me. I love you. How could you possibly think I'd do anything to hurt you? After all, what do I care about patents and circuitry? You'll always have my heart in your hands. Take care of it. And this is a big part of the episode in a way. They will come back later. And honestly, I think maybe they wrote this, having this idea of this heart in the hand before they finished it. Or before, maybe before William Malone finished it. I don't know. So she writes a little heart in his hand, you know, and they're together. And he's like, okay, cool. Like he can trust her. Oh, wait. So they kiss. Yeah, yeah, kiss. And that's how you know they're a couple. And then they go over to look at the coffin of Vladimir Timrak, and it's see-through. It has like, has like glass on top of it, which is kind of weird. And also, one reason Elliot knows about this guy is there's these psycho, I think they're called psycho trading cards. And it's like trading cards of different serial killers. And one of them is Vladimir Timrak. He's number 13. Ooh, there's like a set of 26 cards. And that's how he learned about this guy or how he knows about him. Vladimir Timrak. Number 13 in the world-class psychos trading card set. 26 certified kills, 19 women, 7 men. Timrak was a renowned mesmerist who apparently hypnotized his victims with a single stare. Under his control, they were made to commit terrible and depraved acts before he murdered them and bathed in their blood. Very interesting. Good night, Elliot. I'm not doing this. 
Don't be so dramatic. That's just bullshit they put on these cards so that people will buy them. She's not a fan. She's like, he's crazy. I had no idea it was going to be like that. Like, he was able to do some stuff. Yeah, he killed like 19 women and 7 men or something. But so, Timrek was like this, this mes like mesmerist or like hypnotizer. So he would make them do like terrible things before he murdered them. And then he would bathe in their blood. So it's just a lot of things. And so... Um, Ariane is ready to go. She's like, I don't want to be here. I don't like this. I don't like that we're going into his mind or whatever we're going to do. And so he's like, well, we're going to do it. We're here. And she's like, Ugh. so they get the machine set up. Actually, I guess it's not a glass. Never mind. It's not a glass door, but it's like a lid. There's like a, there is like a glass window, which I don't know why. I guess because maybe this is like a, I still feel like it wouldn't be like public too much for this, but there's a lid and then you pull that lid off. And then there's like a door you can pop off. Again, I don't know why you can pop it off so easily. And there's like a glass window and they look in the glass window and the makeup is not great. So Tim Rack is laying there dead. He's like strapped down in like a bundle in the coffin and the makeup's really like clotted and just kind of fake. Look, it doesn't look that great. They look down into him. He still kind of looks alive. I think yeah, his eyes are like still open, I think. So they set up all the equipment. It kind of looks like, I don't know, there's just like this weird little hat they can wear over their head. And they have one over Tim Rack's head in the coffin. And he's wearing it. Elliot's wearing it too. And they're like trying to like transfer power and thoughts and things from Tim Rack. Honestly, the setup board he has looks like it's something for like sound editing. So he's like, I need more power. And she's like, okay. So she walks over and puts the little helmet on too while he's fiddling around with all the stuff. So she's got it on and Tim Rack's got it on. Like they're both wearing the little helmets or the little like plastic caps or whatever. And then he happens to see like next to his stuff, he has like a backpack and there's a paper sticking out of it. And it's some letter from the British Biotron LTD, which is like a biotronics specialist type company. And it's a letter and he opens the letter while she's got this stuff. You know, she's over in the background. He opens the letter and he sees that there's a letter to her where they're interested in the experiments she sent them. So it looks like she has sent off his ideas and work. So he was right that she's like underselling, like he's, she's selling him out, you know, for like patents and stuff on this work. And so he sees that and he's like, oh my gosh, Arion, I can't believe you did that. He's like, do you want to hear this? Like, let's do this. Let's do this experiment. And so he takes the the crank and like, you know, turns it up to 11 or whatever, right? And Tim Rex's body starts shaking in the coffin and she gets zapped so hard that it kills her. And she's like screaming and then he immediately starts like turning to turn out. But yeah, it, it kills her. And this takes up six to seven minutes of the whole episode, just that scene. So now it cuts to um, a bicycle riding up to some stairs and it's kind of dark out and there's like a bundle of mail getting dropped off at this building just outside. And then it shows Elliot up against the wall uh, of like his apartment. Like he's sitting there in the dark. Is He's like reading out loud in his head, like in the background, a letter from someone that has looked at his experiments and his memory recovery experiments and things like that. He finds out he's a recipient of an annual 100,000 pound grant based on some of this work and, I guess, effects he got from when she died. Um, and so you think maybe he's in an apartment or something, but he's not. So what he's in is he's in a mental health facility. So he got this letter about getting the grant with the work, but it was delivered to the mental health facility that he's staying at called the Sussex Hospital for Mental Health. And the sign is spelled wrong. Um, it says no unauthorized personnel, but unauthorized it's spelled wrong. They are missing the second you. So that's, you know, a little faux pas there, but that's spelled wrong. And it cuts to like, they show the, now it's daytime and they show the mental facility. And so I don't, okay. So what I think is the, the transition there is weird. So I think maybe what happened is he read that letter because it almost seems like this was a dream, but I don't think so. I think what happened is he read that letter and then it made him crazy because he was already like not doing great from her death. But then finding out, I guess that his grant was accepted based on those results or something. I don't know, did him in. Now he's in a mental facility and he's strapped to the bed and it's a really stark, just empty room. It's dark. There's just a light on him and he's in the straight jacket and like moving around and moving around. And he sees someone else on her. He sees her, Ariane, like being tortured, like in a, a lab. And there's like other women in tubes who are naked. And Ariane is like crying out and he's freaking out. It's just really weird scene. There's like, so this is like, this is kind of like the dream scene too. So it's like, it's kind of hard to tell. Like, I guess what it is, is he, okay, so he read the letter, went to the mental facility, and then now this is like a dream he's having at the mental facility when he's sleeping. So he's seen her being kind of, not really tortured, but they're like setting it up to where it would be better. There's like lightning. And then Tim Rack shows up and it's just like this dude who like just has a lot of white makeup on. And that's played by Roger Ashton Griffiths. 
he's kind of like watching them from across the room and then like a lever gets pulled or whatever and she's like shaking and then that's when Elliot wakes up. And so now I guess he's just in like a regular hospital because he's not strapped to anything anymore. So I don't know. I don't I, can't, I don't know if they found him like that. Did he get the grant? I guess he did. I don't know which was all a dream. The way this thing runs together is kind of weird. Uh, so he's laying there in bed. He wakes up. He's all sweaty. And he notices there's a lot of flies on the wall in the hospital. And the flies make this little like circle sigil looking thing, like this little shape. And he's immediately like, oh my gosh, the flies, <laughs> the sigil. And he draws it and he's like, I got it. Like that's like the last piece he needed to solve whatever this experiment is that he's doing. And so now he has a guest and this is Malcolm played by Jonathan Firth. And he's like a friend of his who is kind of like helping him with the research, I think, but is also maybe not someone to be trusted. There's like a book that Tim Rack had. Malcolm's telling Elliot he needs to go home and, you know, asking him where the book is or asking Malcolm where the book is. Did you find the book? And Malcolm's like, I'm still looking for the book. It's just at this point, I'm like, I don't even know what's happening. Malcolm's like, Elliot, you should leave this alone. And he's like, no, I want to find out what happened to Ariane. Suck it. Elliot. What is this? Something I need. What you need is to go home. Home? Yes. Wonderful. What about the book? Malcolm, did you find the book? I'm still looking for it. Elliot. I think you should leave this alone. No, I, I know what happened now, Malcolm. Ariane saw, heard what no one is meant to hear. For an instant in time, that the world of the living and the world of the dead collided and it killed her. I have to know what it was. And so he wants to bring Ariane back from the other side because he killed her. So then it goes from the hospital and it just cuts from straight from the hospital to Elliot there like in like a duster type coat. And he's looking down into a coffin. Like he opened up another coffin because these coffins are just sitting out for everybody. And he has stolen, I want to say this was Arion, but he's been stealing bodies of dead women. So he stole bodies of dead women. How? I don't know. I thought he was in the hospital, but now he's out and we've skipped through whatever time. I don't even know where he's at, but it just skips to like this room. And this room's kind of set up kind of neat. Maybe he's at the college. I don't know. Base maybe he's at the basement, but he's got all these dead women, right? And it's like people acting it out. Like they got the makeup on and they think, eh, they might, oh, she has clothes on. Yeah, I think they got clothes on. But they're all like tied down to different little like electric chairs. And there's all these um, machinery and wires and stuff. And this scene looks kind of neat. I think the way they set up like the different wires and the machines and all this is kind of fun. I just don't know how this all happened and how long the timeline has been and why hasn't he gotten caught taking all these bodies. So he's got all these bodies lined, like set up, and I guess he's going to take all their energy now that he had the sigil and stuff like that and figured it out to bring back, or this design, to bring back Arion. So he slides like this piece of paper with like some runes or markings or something on it into this machine. He's got the new sigil sign and he turns everything on and pulls the lever and papers start flying and there's lightning. And again, this seems kind of fun. I think they did an okay job. The women are like kind of moving where they're at. I don't know how we got here, but it's not, it doesn't look bad. And it works. The experiment works. Ariane gets brought back. So Ariane comes back and she's like, hey, and she reaches out and it skips immediately to them in his bed making love. Um, so you're like, okay, well, they didn't waste any time. So they're in bed and they're like, you know, like kissing and, and naked and rolling around and stuff. She says something to him where she's like, I want to learn all about your face so I don't forget it. Like she's studying him and he's like, why are you studying me? You're going to be here now. You're here. And she's like, no, I'm not real. And then she starts panicking. I'm not real. Why am I here? What did you do? What, why am I here? You shouldn't have brought me here. And he's like, no, you can be here. It's okay. I got you. And she's like, no. And then again, there's so much in this episode that they're trying, they don't really explain. But luckily this scene here, there's a little bit more exposition and explanation from the character of a Arion when she comes back, which I was like, oh, thank you for that. Because I really probably wouldn't know what was going on had she not had this like little speech here. What is this? 
I'm not real. I can feel it. I'm not really here. You are real. You're here with me. No, Elliot. I'm not. I'm an illusion. A memory. A flickering image on a movie screen. You willed me here. You reached down into death and you pulled me out. But I can't stay with you. Yes. Yes, you can. As long as that machine is on, you can be here with me. Someday the machine will fail and I'll have to go back. What did you hear that night? Dark. Pain. The pain of the dead. So strong, the screams. They were his dead. Tim Rack. The flesh of the dead can be torn a thousand times. That's when you start hearing like sounds and stuff. And Tim Rack's back. He's coming back to get her. And then this scene is definitely like House on Haunted Hill. So they have... They have the guy playing Tim Rack on like a dolly and they're pushing him and you can't see it. So it looks like he's kind of floating. But he's got a knife and he's like holding a bloody knife to his mouth and he's like kind of bleeding and he's got the makeup on, like the white clotted makeup. And they're pushing him on the dolly so he looks like he's floating and there's more papers flying and there's lightning. And it looks like they ran into the other room. So yeah. Okay, so they're back in the room with the dead lady. So I guess this is just at his place. He has it like set up in a side room. It's a really big room. And so now they're both in this room with the dead ladies and she's like, he's, he's coming back for me. You have to shut the machine down. If you don't, you know, I, I can't, I have to go. And Elliot's like, no, I don't want to shut the machine down. I'll modify it. Cause like by leaving the machine on, I guess it leaves it open for Tim Rec to come through as well. Something like that. So she's like, no, I have to go with him. He's coming for me. And again, there's just papers flying and lots of shaky cam on Tim Rec's face. He comes up, Tim Rec comes up behind Ariana and like puts a knife to her neck and is like threat, you know, gonna take her. So then Elliot pulls the cords and like messes up the machine. So now the machine's like short circuited. So I guess it's gonna take even longer to fix it if he wanted to. Still dead women in the room. And so then he watches Tim Rack and Ariane just like disappear. Like you don't see, they just kind of like fade away. So she had to go back with them. So she's back on the other side now in this torturous place that he has whatever he's doing to her. So now it just shows nighttime. Could be the same night. We don't know. I think it probably is. Maybe. I don't know. There's still dead women in that house. And he's looking through all these papers. And he's like trying to figure out how he can fix this. How he can keep it open so that she can stay. So that's when his friend Malcolm shows back up. And he tells Malcolm, he's like, she's calling me. She wants, she wants me to help her. I need to help her. And Malcolm's like, come on. You need to relax. You haven't slept in like days or something. So he walks Elliot to his bed and is like, okay, go to sleep. And then it turns out like Malcolm had found the book that they were looking for. Um, he said it was quite expensive, got it from a collector. As he goes to leave, he's like, I'll just leave it on the table. And so Elliot's like already asleep. It's called the, I think the secrets of death and the mind. But next to the book is a diary. So then Malcolm sees the diary and he opens it up and kind of skims it a bit and then he takes it. So then it cuts later, like it's like the next morning. Again, that other room is covered in papers and dead women and chairs and it's in his apartment, I guess. It's the next morning, and so Malcolm has read whatever he has read, I guess, about what's going on, the experiments, and everything, because for some reason, Elliot decided to write all this down in his diary, which is pretty incriminating. They just cut to, like, Malcolm explaining something to a police officer. The sergeant, Sergeant Baker, played by Gordon Peters, coming out of the building and just, like, meeting them and everything. And so they go back to the apartment, I guess, to arrest him. Uh, Malcolm's like, you should talk to Elliot and explain everything and, you know, speak to him about what we read in the diary, and we can help him. He, like, kind of wants to help him, I think. Um, I think he's kind of probably a good guy, but I don't, I don't know. He doesn't know what to do to help his friend. The sergeant, Sergeant Baker is like, yeah, you can't really speak to him. He won't be doing a lot of talking back. And so they cut to this pretty gory scene or like bloody scene of Elliot in a bathtub and it's full of blood and water. He has unfortunately slit his wrists and killed himself. It's pretty, you know, it's a, it's a sad kind of messed up scene. And then they come back to the heart. So the other cop is like, hey, there's something important I need to tell you about this room or whatever. He's like, somehow there is a heart written on the outside of the window from the outside. But this is a couple floors up, like on the second floor. So how could someone have done it? The windows are painted shut. You can tell from the angle, like from where Elliot's in the bathtub, he can see the heart from where he's at. And then you just hear Malcolm go, she came back for him. And I'm like, what? Wait, what? <laughs> so she came back for him. And so now they're together in the afterlife. Have you read this? 
The matters they come. Grave robbing, ghosts. It's a lot of nonsense, isn't it? Can I speak to him? <laughs> you can. But I'm afraid he won't be doing a lot of talking back. Elliot. Poor bastard. Sir, um, we found something. I don't know if it's important. Well, what is it? It's on the window, sir. There's something written in the dew. Yes? Well, it's just that it's, um... It's on the outside, sir. And all the windows on the second floor are painted shut. She came back then. They're all fighting demons now. Are they fighting Timrak? Did Timrak die? I don't think so. Like, wouldn't they both be... So it, it looks like Elliot woke up, saw the book, was reading it, because the book's next to him by the bathtub, the book that Malcolm brought. And he was like, cool, I can fix this. And so he decided just to go be with her, I guess. I don't know. So basically, she came back to get him, and now they're in the afterlife together. I guess it's supposed to be romantic. And then also the other thing I forgot to mention, she explains in her, exp like, Arion in her exposition later, she explains that whole letter that Elliot had seen where he thought that Arion sold off his stuff to make a patent or money or whatever. That was actually fake. Tim Rack was messing with his mind and making him see things that weren't there. So she still, I don't think, had sold off his stuff. No one did. So he saw that, even though that wasn't what happened, and then that's when he turned up all that power. So it's like, that's what he would have done because he got mad. So it's like, just seeing how you would be because you're mad about that. And then finding out it didn't even happen. And then he killed her. It's like, he didn't mean to, but like he killed her. But now everything's cool. And I guess they're just off in the afterworld. Yeah, so that's how it ends. So I think for me, part of it, I think they had that whole heart thing in like the window and the heart at the end and thought that seemed cool. And maybe just, maybe William Malone just wrote the whole episode around that. I don't know. I don't normally look up the comics that it comes from. I might check it every once in a while, but I didn't start out doing the podcast doing that. But for this one, I was curious. And I was like, I wonder if this is similar to the comic that it's off of. So I looked it up. It's from Vault of Horror number 15. There is a story in there called Report from the Grave. And really the only similarity is that there are graveyard scenes. And I mean, it is called Report from the Grave. But I think it's about like some older guys trying to do like an, either an initiation or some sort of, some sort of thing with death. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's not really at all connected. Part of me thinks that that's what they, just, they did with the whole heart thing. They thought that was a cool ending. For me, it all fell flat. It was really confusing and kind of disjointed. I mean, I get some of the stuff with like his guilt. And again, some of the props and the scenery didn't look bad, but it's too confusing. There's too much stuff in this episode. So it didn't work for me. That's the end of season seven, episode eight, Report from the Grave. Yeah, so then it cuts back to the Crypt Keeper. He is still farming. He's in a little plaid shirt and a little hat, and he's just throwing out them puns and having a great time. <laughs> Crypt Keeper, you're so punny. And the best Crypt Keeper pun is... I've just got to finish with the artichokes. Come on, Artie, die already! <laughs> now, a little water and some fertilizer. And before you know it, I'll be harvesting my own little field of screams. You didn't know your pal the Crypt Keeper had a green thumb, did you? Well, I do. And the rest of me is pretty damn moldy, too. <laughs> okay, and then there is some IMDb trivia for this episode. Coming back to House on Haunted Hill in 1999, directed by the same director who did this, William Malone. The name Vladimir Timrak appears on Price's guest list in that movie. So Timrak was the killer and evil spirit character in the Tales from the Crypt episode, Report from the Grave. That's just a little trivia there. I can definitely see the different, the, the similarities though, with the way it was directed. So that was season seven, episode eight, Report from the Grave. The next episode is season seven, episode nine, Smoke Rings, and that's W-R-I-N-G-S. Thank you all so much for downloading and listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. You can email me at goodeveningpod at gmail.com. You can follow me on Twitter at Gek Podcast. That's G-E-K Podcast. You can also follow Gus the Podcat at a sweet cat named Gus. 
on Instagram and I also have moved or I also started an Instagram page for the Good Evening Kitties podcast. I think it's just under the underscore geck underscore podcast I think is what it's under. You can follow me there if you'd like and yeah just leave a review and I'll read it on the podcast. So yeah thanks again. Bye!